You're listening to The Fan Marillion, an unofficial companion podcast for the Amazon Prime series, The Rings of Power. I'm your host, Glorfindahl, reacting to the show each week, and this week I'm sending this episode back to the fiery chasm from whence it came. I'm covering The Rings of Power, Episode 6, Udun. So if you haven't watched it yet, turn back now, because there's going to be a seismic load of spoilers, an eruption of spoilers. You can't have any craters in your show knowledge, or else the magma of my spoilers will pull into the crags of your mind. A volcano erupted. Yeah, yeah, I think we got it. Amazon does not reveal the names of episodes in advance. You just find out when the file drops. And this episode is a case study in why. What is Udun, you ask? After watching, I think you can guess. It's an elvish word that means literally hell. Remember when Gandalf calls the Balrog a flame of Udun? That is why. I understood it to be another term used for Mordor during Sauron's reign there, but in fact, upon Q seeing that assumption, I discovered last night, Udun is not slang for Mordor as a whole. It's a very specific, seismically active valley of Mordor. And the lore masters credit this valley as the birthplace of Mount Doom. So, once again, the showrunners have done their homework and dug deep into the lore to mine for banal features of Middle-earth, like a shiny ore last week, to sculpt into this life-or-death epic explodey plot thread that's ripe for premium television. It's a skill. Mount Doom can't just be a hot volcano that Sauron forges in and he chooses his land strategically because it's there, that's basic shit. Mm -mm, That's not prequely enough. Mount Doom had to get its own origin story and become man-made with this intricate Rube Goldberg machine of tunnel digs and slave labor and hydro-powered engineering. No item or cloth or rock or person is too minor in the texts to invoke the sacred butterfly effect in a prequel in the year 2022. Next week, I thoroughly expect to see the origin story for Lembus bread. Like Galadriel will invent it out on the road, and there'll be a swelling of bassoons and a gust of wind as it meaningfully bakes. She'll be like, oh, I'm so hungry. The explosion wiped out the food stores. If only I could bake a bread where one small bite can fill the stomach of a grown man. And Bronwyn will use her healer expertise and say, Ah ha ha, I have just the herb that expands in the stomach. Exactly so. But let's get real. All joking aside, I was enthralled this episode, especially in the final 10 minutes. Holy Iluvatar, I rate this episode one glass of wine, which is the best rating possible. It means I was so riveted, I didn't need to refill. Although... Plenty in the first half made me run through that glass quickly. If things hadn't turned around with Adar's bait and switch in the village, I was preparing to head back into the bottle. I've been wondering where this billion-dollar budget has been, and this week surely used a few wads of bills. And this is a first. Two amazing episode ratings in a row. Until now, I've been very up and down from episode to episode. But here, as we approach the finale, things are picking up and threads are coming together, moving forward as teams and answering questions. With only two episodes left, will these escalations continue? Only time will tell. Let's go forth and sink our Uruk teeth deep into it, shall we? When we left off with our heroes in the Southlands last week, the orcs were marching up the hill and the Southlanders were holed up in the watchtower with slim to no solutions prepared. In the time that's passed, the gang decided on the strategy of flee, which I like, 
while Arondir elaborately homalones the place. Now, this watchtower, I thought elves were supposed to be superior architects, making the entire weight of a tower reliant on one rope pulley? That seems like horrible design, and would pass a whopping zero inspections. How has this tower even been standing for as long as it has with such a Death Star-level weakness? But it looked good for Arondir's big moment at the beginning of the episode. And we're here for Arondir. Watching Adar's Wave 1 go up in smoke was also a thrill, so hashtag worth it. But the next day, the Southlanders are taking advantage of that daylight window to prep for the next inevitable attack. By the time the orcs come again, I couldn't help but think that these Southland folk have been up and operating at like an eleven for a full two days and nights, or more at this point. Like, there's no way they're fit for battle. I was tired just looking at them. But there they go. I want to acknowledge that throughout season one, the script has truly inspired moments where it hits that Tolkienish mixture of mm, wisdom and natural wonderment that it's aiming for. Case in point, Arondir and Adar both burying the fancy seeds before a battle, and how Arondir soulfully explains that reasoning to Bronwyn. Beautiful. Very Tolkien. If I didn't know better, I'd suspect that was straight from one of the books. It was nicely done. But for every moment like that, there are five more that look like Theo saying, mm, Remember when I was small and scared of the dark? What was that thing? That thing you used to say to me? And Bronwyn says this mishmash observation about how light erases a shadow and shadows are fleeting like yes that is how the sun works um you should chase the light because light beats shadow gil galad and galadriel are drowning us in light discourse already i really don't need this dead horse coming from the humans too the script drudges up a lot of nostalgia for me in a bad way it threw me back to being theo's age again meeting fanfiction people on the web, and setting times to link up together late at night in whatever fucking time zone we were in, and we would designate characters. And then we would roleplay dialogue and little asterisk actions as our characters. And we would co-op fanfic together for hours. And the reason I bring this up is because Bronwyn's Shadow and Light speech sounded like it was taken directly from my 2001 MSN Messenger chat archive. This is how someone reaches to capture a Tolkien manner of speech and fails. When I watched the episode a second time, I was multitasking, so mostly I listened to the episode. And there's a solid 25 minutes or so that are just dogs breathing into a Foley mic to make the orcish huffing and puffing. Orcs are a lot like pugs, like the tiniest steps are exhausting. They gasp for air, just making eye contact. This episode was a visceral Halloween horror episode. The orcs attacked twice. Arondir bested them twice. And then Adar outmaneuvered them in the end twice. Everyone was very busy. Twice. It was the goriest and most action-packed yet. I hope this assuages the complainants online about the lack of big Jackson-type battles. But do these people forget that sweet slave pit fight with the chain whip? Or the fact that it's a whole season of TV, so like, why would we need battles more than once a season? Maybe I'm just a lover of a slow burn, but I don't need more than one battle a season, guys. And I hate that people are forcing me to use the term slow burn with this show because I feel like the Numenor stuff especially was very two-dimensional and simplistic and rushed. What happened in Numenor over two episodes should have taken the full season to really find some nuance and texture and have decisions feel like they have real impact. Anyway, that's my two cents on pacing. The entire internet disagrees with me, so fine. 
we'll agree to disagree on the pacing. But anyway, here, have your fucking battles. Have them. Twice. Now stop complaining that there's no battles, please. And the blood. The horror movie technicians were working overtime this week. The endless eyeball blood that dripped into Arondir's mouth. Bronwyn's gaping flesh wounds just oozing ounce after ounce. This was so gory. I loved it. And I don't care for gore usually, but it's okay in fantasy in the right spots, I guess. A gut punch for our villager heroes comes about halfway through the episode. The orcs let them feel like they've won so that they come out to inspect the dead. Only to remove some helmets and discover they killed many of their fellow townspeople who defected to Adar a few days ago in fear of their lives. So the Southlanders from these villages here by the Elven Watchtower have been doing a little accidental kinslaying. See, Lorehands, we got our kinslaying after all. It just looks different. Suddenly, the menfolk don't feel so good about their victory. And the rest of the orcs come out of hiding to reveal their true intentions in the second half of the episode. And that reassured all the armchair tacticians watching at home, myself included, who heaved one big communal sigh after spending the first 25 minutes yelling at the screen like, why are all the orcs just coming head on in a pack instead of encircling the village? And why do these orcs with night vision need to announce their coming with a hundred torches? Touché, Adar. Adar followed the villagers' playbook and did a bait-and-switch right back at him. What's good for the goose is good for the Adar. This time, it was the villagers who underestimated the orcs. And because the orcs look so incredible, I'm going to keep giving kudos to the costume, prosthetics, makeup, etc. These orcs are such an improvement over the horrid CGI monstrosities of the Hobbit trilogy. These orcs are a joyous return to the practical wonderland that was Lord of the Rings creatures. Please and thank you. And speaking of pleasing the crowds, our equestrian lovers will be pleased this week. We finally saw the Numenorean horses in their multitudes and all in formation, galloping beautifully across the plains in their Sunday best, with their hair braided and their cute helmets and their matching saddles. These are fashion horses. I don't care one way or the other about horses usually, and even I was impressed with these beauties. The Jackson movies went all the way on horse riding and training for the actors. This episode felt like an attempt to tap back into that energy, that power and grace of the cavalry. Horses are such a core tenet of the fantasy genre. It's rare you see a big fantasy epic anymore without a lot of equestrian focus. Then there was that riding and spear stunt that Hullbrand and Adar do towards the end, where the horse trips. I laughed out loud when the camera made a purposeful pan over to the horse and the horse just shrugs and got up and wandered off. And the camera was there for like a full three seconds. So there was no doubt the horse was fine. I was like, right, yes, the fans need to know that the horse was okay. Fuck Adar, he can break all his ribs, but I need to see that horse walk off set and dust himself off. And after the horse stunt, we learned that Halbrand knows Adar, but Adar doesn't remember Halbrand. Ultimate shade! It suggested that Adar was responsible for his wife and children's deaths but we're still not sure what it was that Halbrand did in Middle-earth that he's so ashamed of. That mystery is still in play. How did all these Numenorean ships get from embarking yesterday, while the orcs were approaching Arondir's watchtower, to landing in Middle-earth and riding across the Southlands to reach this particular village 32 hours later? How, you ask? Why, it's my favorite big-budget TV trope, teleportation. 
We are teleporting again this week. Love it takes me right out of an otherwise very expensive and well-executed episode. Once again, all the other departments have understood their assignments, but the writers still struggle with the passage of time and conveying this in different plot threads to their audiences, or rather, not doing so at all. When you juxtapose a scene that has a clear timetable with a scene that doesn't, an audience has no other cue to go on but the cue they get. I have zero screenwriting education and yet, as a viewer, can point to freshman blunders like this for easy-to-understand concepts. This was embarrassing. And even if, as a screenwriter, you didn't read into how that works before, you certainly understood it after continental teleportation became a three-season-long meme for what was previously the most expensive TV show of all time. I crack jokes about Game of Thrones teleportation all the time because that was the signal to the audience that the writers were off book and had no concept of audience cues as though they had never consumed long-form storytelling on TV themselves before. Like, we as viewers understand when these concepts aren't executed correctly, so then why are the actual experts not aware? The Game of Thrones fandom points to the start of the teleporting as the beginning of the series' downfall, and when viewer investment was forced out of the episodes, everything became quippy, and pieces moved around like quick games of checkers, and their stories went from three-dimensional down to two-dimensional. And I hate to make that callback to Game of Thrones here, especially when the new show, uh, what's it called, House of Dragons, is almost kind of indirect competition with Rings of Power, uh, even though both, both is good. Um, but that's the Rings of Power Numenor story thread to me, honestly. And what cooks my grits the most about it this episode was that the teleporting was so easy to avoid. That was an easy lesson to learn, but apparently not one worth overcoming with front-loading some more appropriate pacing. I'm easy to please. I could have settled for a simple time establishment line on the boat. Isidore's chatting with Galadriel about a uh, literal horseshit. That line could have been replaced with an, hmm, it's been two months aboard this ship. I'll almost be sad to make land right before they dock. Like that would have done it. End of story. That really would have been all it took for a viewer to reorganize some events from season one in their head and be all set to proceed. Truly, I feel like there is no QC on these scripts. They do super deep cuts like Udun and then blow their credits immediately on junior crap like this. It's fucking wasteful. You're wasting all this credit I keep working so hard to give you. And they can't even argue that the story threads are out of alignment without explicitly saying so in the script, because we had that establishing shot in the very first episode of the comet and all the different story threads seeing and reacting to it in real time. That communicated to us as an audience that all of the story threads are operating in real time with each other. Speaking of junior crap... Let's talk about the Queen Regent's armor. Oh my god! The early press stills showed that her armor was just a fabric printed long sleeve Henley, and that got so much blowback on the internet, asking, where's the billion dollars? I want to see it. I was on the fence whether to take that at face value or not, because on the one hand, a press still is early. Maybe the armor's not done smithing. And you can tell I know nothing of armor making because I'll say things like, maybe the armor's not done smithing. But you know what I'm trying to say. Maybe it'll be done in time to do reshoots of her close-ups. Plenty of great products get polished in the smaller scale reshoots. Oh my valor, it is absolutely just a fabric print long sleeve Henley of the gold scale armor designs. Obviously, the designers had a vision. They did their job. But then I'm imagining the schedule didn't allow for any actual armor production. 
You can see it fold as she moves. It's excruciating. Studios really need to understand that big budget productions need the pre-production time so that it looks like it's budget. Because a show rushed to the sound stages with just some printed Henleys and forgettable costumes that characters wear for three episodes straight. I'm looking at you, Galadriel. In a city that's entirely CGI'd after the cast goes home is not what an audience who's already savvy from other premium television experiences and who's watching on huge 4K televisions expect. This is especially true about a show whose initial advertising hinged on this being the most expensive show ever made. You make that claim, you need to back it up. Because fans throughout season one have not been shy in pointing out that the Peter Jackson trilogy, with only a fraction of the Amazon budget, nailed so much more practical design and execution 20 years ago, I might add. Pre-production is essential. Now, I want to get into my man Adar. Or Adar. I say it differently every time. Haven't nailed that yet. I'll get it, you know, after he's finally killed. I'm sure. Uh, this was his episode. Galadriel and Adar share a glorious interrogation sequence in a barn, and we finally see Joseph Molly's acting chops. Before now, we only got a glimpse here, a glibe one-liner there. Joseph got his day, and what a day it was. We learned that Adar is indeed one of the early elves tortured and turned by Morgoth, and was used to beget what we know now as orcs, or as he corrects us, the more elvish word Uruk. Adar fills in the gaps in the timeline. He explains that while Galadriel was out searching for Sauron, Sauron was busy uniting the dark forces throughout Middle-earth. And, Adar confirms, Sauron was indeed at that fortress up in the icy waste during the timeline she suspected, and he was looking for something. A method of dark magic wherein he acquires dominion over flesh. Hmm, sounds about right. Perhaps the answer he's been hunting for... The reason it hasn't worked before now will lie in his new forge. He tried it cold. Now he's going to try it hot. And then Galadriel went whole hog Fionor on him too. Like, I'm going to go genocide your whole race and then come back and kill you last. A blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman that believes in genocide. See angry people on the internet? You're represented after all. We have several soft moments this episode to contrast with the brutal orc battles. First up, Arondir and Bronwyn finally kiss after she helps him to plant his seed. I'm just describing the episode here. Why are you laughing? And she does so after he professes his intentions to settle down with her and Theo. He expressly commits to stepfatherhood out loud. And that was the winning answer that earned him a kiss. Well done, Arondir. Although it wasn't exciting at all. Actually, they completely cut away and we only saw the kiss from a distance. So there's two options here. Either it was planned to be super chaste like that which is fine. It was lovely. Or option two, they had no chemistry and this was the best take they could get. Mm, let's just say if you were looking for Bridgerton style kiss buildup and execution, you can go straight back to Netflix with those expectations. Second, Galadriel, nosy and entitled as all hell, just straight up asks Elendil about his dead wife. This sweet widower has done nothing but support this elf since he fished her out of sea flotsam, and at dawn, she drops a, mm, what happened to your wife, 
Everyone's barely awake, ma'am. There's been no breakfast. We need to get ready to hit land and disembark and then go fight orcs and probably die. You want to bring my dead wife to the forefront of my thoughts this morning at this here sleepy sunrise? Okay, you know what? All right, listen, I'll tell you what happened. She drowned. Mic drop. Alindil just walks away. Devastating. Now do you feel like a big commander having upset the general right before battle? What's wrong with you, Galadriel? You knew she was dead. Speaking of Galadriel's unmanaged baggage, she and Halbrand share a, hmm, what I'm choosing to define as a moment of friendship and hope where they teach each other that there is life after trauma and loss and warfare and together they will encourage each other to continue to step back from that ledge, my friend. That is my willful, hopeful reading of that hero-to-hero conversation on a log. I know every single soul was shouting, No! at their television. Do not do that, Amazon. I would do anything for second age lore but i won't do that i know every showrunner likes a love triangle and so caliborn could be made to compete with someone next season but no not that and if we all say it out loud three times. Maybe we can get that energy to manifest and just make sure that the next two episodes are not that. And then the end of the episode arrives. There's laughing and drinking. Numenor and the Southlands have met. They're having a nice lunch. The Southland has a king again. Hurrah! I didn't realize claiming lordship over, like, a thousand square miles of very fertile, valuable land that's already inhabited was as easy as carving a medallion and asking a rich stranger to vouch for you. Halbrand's kingly acquisition had the energy of Michael Scott just standing up in the middle of the office and shouting, I declare bankruptcy! I guess I always expected it to be fairly simple, because the Southlands are shown to be just a collection of villages monitored by the elves. But if it was this easy all along, I guess I'm just confused why someone else with ambition didn't try it long before this. Like, before 23andMe, who the fuck even knows and can QC a lost line of kings? It worked for Aragorn because an entire army of ghosts served as his 23andMe confirmation. But you know, who's vouching for Halbrand? No one, really. Nothing. At all. A a medallion he carries on his belt that, as he quipped in his own words, he could have just stolen from someone. But all right. Whatever. It's fantasy. That's how it goes in fantasy. No one needs proof. Everything is a lawless wasteland, except for when it isn't, at the discretion of the author. So, cue the ending. You expect the credits to roll. Or, if you're watching the little progress bar at the bottom, you see there's a few minutes left. You might think, "Mm, we'll cut to a check-in with one of our other locations. Or we could go see Elrond. Or Gilgalad, or we could check in on Durin, or Disa, or we could go see the Harfoots, we could check on Nori, or Gandalf, none of whom were in this week's episode, actually, so maybe we'll just peep at them here at the end. Theo's unwrapping the sword hilt bundle, and realizes Adar swindled them all with another underhanded bait-and-switch. And you get excited a little bit, but you're still expecting the credits to roll. That's when the screen pans to ragged old Waldrick being tricky-dicky, and you were already half out of your chair, ready to go to the bathroom because you had to pee and you thought we were done. But the music starts to swell, and the sword hilt 
does something and you go, oh shit, and you sit back down and you hold that pee. You hold that pee because then you see a grayed out form of a volcano and you point at it and you go, there, I see it. I see it. And the sword goes all the way in and turns like a key, just like Arondir said it was. And the waterways burst. The river's released on those, oh shit, that's when the tunnels and the trenches were for. Where are they all going? Oh, shit. They're all heading straight to the volcano. Ah, They're all going to go into the magma. The magma's rising. Holy Eru. They're going to do it. They're going to do it this episode. Right now, they're going to do it. Two episodes before the finale. Out of nowhere. Nobody. Not one soul said this was happening tonight. Oh, I just saw it bubble. Oh, yeah. There it goes. It's going up now. We're erupting. We're spewing lava. We're launching fireballs. It is full-blown Vesuvius out here. And so many people who just survived a 48-hour siege by orcs are snuffed out by volcano detritus. It's a veritable trebuchet of fire and brimstone. Oh, shit! That was just the appetizer. Now there's a tidal wave of fire and smoke billowing across the plain like Judgment Day. And the music is swelling. And I'm trying to figure out if this was Sauron's machination with the sword thing or if Adar was the engineer all along who set this up oh shit like half these people have been killed by Adar's big plan this was his whole plan with the trenches and the key thing he did it there's a volcano it erupted we are gonna be forging soon the credits roll the choir starts I finally pee We'll talk all about where things go in Middle-earth from here on the next episode of The Fan Marillion. And now, this week's trivia question. How many forges could a Dark Lord forge if a Dark Lord could forge forges? Well, we just found out. One. Calabrimbor up in Eregion is building that fancy new style of forge for the elves. Recall his explanation to Elrond was that it will reach new, unprecedented temperatures, thus opening up new avenues of metallurgy. Sauron has taken a less scientific and proper approach to the same goal, turning instead to the most unpredictable, but at the same time the most powerful of all forges, Mother Nature. The trivia question is... What is the elvish name for Mount Doom? Seeing as Mount Doom was absolutely the star of the show this week. Well, fans of European metal music might know this answer immediately. The elvish name for Mount Doom is Amon Amarth. Thank you to everyone who joined us on Twitch TV on Thursday for Fan Marillion's Tolkien Trivia, where we played questions for The Hobbit. Join us on Twitch every Thursday before the episode at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. We'll pregame together and help you stay awake for the Rings of Power episode to drop. Next week's trivia theme will be The Two Towers. This includes the novel, the Jackson film, and the relevant section from the Bakshi animation. And now for our vocab segment. Instead of looking ahead at new words this week... I want to look behind. Episode 6, Udun, gave us multiple throwbacks to Middle-earth lines of language used in the Jackson films. For example, when the orcs were shouting commands at the watchtower, I was shocked to realize that I understood a phrase in the black speech of Mordor. Adar's minion shouts, find them, except he says, jimpatul which is part of the One Ring's inscription, right? One Ring to find them. And I was familiar with the inscription because it said a lot in the Mordor speech. Then later, we hear Galadriel urge her horse to ride quickly with a norolim, which is the same phrase we heard Arwen say to her horse when she carried Frodo to the river Anduin. I'm Glorfindal, and this was my show. I welcome your opinion, but remember, I'm not the fandom. I'm just a fan. Join the conversation at Fan Marillion on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch TV. Or, for flaming that's too spicy for socials, send me an email at fanmarillion at gmail.com. 
please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This has been an Opus Knox Media production. Produced and edited by Ali Bachman. For more information on Opus Knox Media, please visit opusnoxmedia.com. <laughs>